Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022. I am delighted to be here with Dr. Terry C. Wallace, Jr. Terry, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's great to be here also. Terry, to start, would you please tell me your current or most recent title and institutional affiliation? Sure. I was the 11th director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, something that I was very proud of. Uh, because I'm a Los Alamos native and being able to be involved in sort of the iconic laboratory matches being able to go to an iconic institution like Caltech. Um, I uh, retired you know, this last year, and so I'm Director Emeritus, uh, happily working on lots of writing projects and occasionally uh, kibitzing on uh, various scientific aspects. Terry, being in Washington right now, tell me about some of your consulting work in the science world. Well, uh, to tell the truth, you know, I'm really blessed that I have a very broad background and I'm a seismologist, obviously. And so a lot of people want me to do things that are related to national security, how seismology can tell you about something else. But I also have a pretty broad background in uh, geology in general and in particular mineralogy. So most of my consulting actually in the last uh, six to seven months has been associated with people asking uh, very specific mineralogy sort of planetology, cosmology, construction of our solar system questions, which is quite delightful to be able to uh, uh, to be able to work on that particular thing at this point in my life. Terry, tell me about stepping down from Los Alamos right in the middle of the pandemic, what some of the challenges were in the timing of that decision. So the timing of the decision really is driven by the government. The government in the uh, early part of uh, this millennia decided that uh, all the national labs would be recompeted meaning that they would move away from a single model for uh, federally funded research and development centers in which they would compete it in a consortium, usually of universities plus private companies would come in. And uh, Los Al I was part of the first time that that uh, uh, action took place at Los Alamos and we took over a contract by what was known as Los Alamos National Security in 2006. And I became a director of, of the science at the laboratory, then director of global security and then became the, like I said, the 11th director. Uh, in the next compete, uh, that particular consortium did not win. And uh, so that was precipitated stepping down, um, but uh, they asked me to stay on uh, in particular to work on some intelligence problems. Um, but uh, the world changed very much in 2019 and uh, much of the work that I, I did and probably most people would do really has to, uh, uh, be face to face and certainly in particular environments. And so what moved us to this incredible electronic world of Zoom or in Los Alamos case, case WebEx. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really interesting. I have large mentoring groups that I try to do. And uh, I, I think that uh, um, our human evolution of the last 75,000 years makes human contact in a central way we communicate and so we're still groping through what it means to uh, uh to rely on electrons to both uh, express empathy and surprise <laughs> terry speaking of course only in your in your capacity as a private citizen going nowhere near any sensitive issues right now we seem to be on the verge of a new cold war what do you think the impact of this is going to be on the national laboratories given their import in national policy and security during what might be considered the first Cold War now? So I think it's going to have tremendous impact. So, I mean, the questions that come back uh, may seem in some ways horrific policy questions, but there are a lot of other science questions that are around it. I mean, um, you know, Los Alamos National Laboratory was responsible for the first atomic bomb. And uh, we certainly built the largest part of uh, the U.S., nuclear deterrent and the laboratory director was responsible for certifying that being safe, secure and reliable. But what we're really worried about now is, you know, the asymmetry that came from a, like a cold war is we wanted to see nuclear weapons be something that's so horrific, which they are, that no one would ever talk about using them. And we moved away from the idea of a small nuclear weapon, for example, and we're poised today for uh, Russia routinely talking about uh, using nuclear weapons uh, for what we call a tactical end, so a small nuclear weapon, which probably has a relatively small amount of uh, fallout, but uh, nevertheless is a tickle to this whole thing about uh, 
humanity with a relatively short period of time being able to completely wipe out the planet. And there's a whole bunch of issues that are around that. So what does it really mean for nuclear weapons to be small, but then also can you can you decide to make those? I mean, not, I'm not saying that we should do that, but I'm saying that that's the kind of question. In addition, of course, the National Labs have always been involved in trying to understand um, what are the other sort of weapons of mass destruction you expect to see on a, a battlefield. We just came through COVID. And of course, there was always this kind of cloud around COVID. Was it related to an escape from a laboratory that was working on a potential bioweapon? Well, you know, what we have to really worry about right now is will a bioweapon be used on a battlefield? A bioweapon can be as benign as uh, influenza, just making everybody sick so they're not uh, particularly productive. We've all we've worried about that in the U.S., but it could be much worse. Uh, chemical weapons the same. We know that uh, Russia, uh, in its support of uh, Assad in Syria, uh, routinely uh, was involved in chemical weapons. And so, you know, how do you ameliorate this? How do you... Uh, how do you provide the forensic evidence that things really happen? These kind of questions are pretty uh, germane right now. The laboratory has often worked on things we'll never talk about. Then doesn't have anything to do with nuclear weapons, but they do support um, U.S. national security imperatives. And they can be everything from a new material uh, to being able to understand how you do communications in a secure way. And so uh, right now that's a... Uh, a very important uh, set of discussions that are going on and we're trying to understand the, those kind of questions as we go forward and uh, frankly this is a frightening time that uh, may portend not just the cold war but maybe a very different world uh, we've gone from sort of being a superpower to maybe talking about bipolar but maybe it's multipolar and trying to understand what it means to be a u.s citizen even in that world and then how you support that is a uh, is actually a really rich science and technology question. Terry, some broad-based questions relating to your directorship at Los Alamos. What were the most important science missions happening at the laboratory during your directorship? What kind of research did you want to foster? So um, my particular, I would say, interest, but also what uh, I contributed there has always been on the intelligence side. And so uh, classically, Los Alamos, the very first intelligence mission it received was in 1944, and uh, it was, did the Nazis have an atomic bomb? How close were they? And uh, we developed things like Luis Alvarez was here and developed the first xenon krypton detector that could be flown and things like that. That extended to the time I was director and senior intelligence official. Uh, but the breadth of the kind of science questions expanded dramatically. And so the question would be, you know, how secure is an electronic grid? What do you need to do to secure it? And um, how can you use the electronic grid as an intelligence gathering device? I mean, you know, every time you turn on your computer, I probably could tell that down the street because your computer has a particular kind of signature. Um, we were very involved in uh, developing large scale modeling and simulation tools that do things like for the pandemic. So we were a leader in pandemic research in terms of providing uh, both kind of uh, simulations on what to expect, but also on uh, computer-aided development of uh, uh, vaccines and, uh, and therapeutics. And in fact, uh, one of my close colleagues who was also a Caltech grad, uh, Betty Korber is one of the world's leading experts in the HIV, but she became extremely important in understanding uh, mutations within the uh, SARS-2 virus and what it what it could mean for uh, a vaccine campaign. Uh, we also, you know, one of the big things of uh, really important for that Los Alamos contribute is on material science. So uh, we have a, had and continue to have a really large effort in understanding, for example, uh, something like graphene. Oh, really marvelous material, right? But what can you do that has an impact on a national perspective from an energy security perspective or maybe from a, a communication perspective? And so there's a lot of research in new materials in particular, really trying to understand um, things like conductivity or new generation of batteries. Uh, we've known 
at least at Los Alamos, certainly for 15 years, that lithium was not an answer to long-term battery storage. And so can you add sulfur to lithium? Can you do something to make a, the battery much more reliable long-term? And so there's a lot of effort in those kinds of things also. Terry, I'm curious, by the time you became director, had the shadow of the Wen Ho Lee scandal faded by that point? Was it still felt? Were security practices that arose as a result of that still in place by the time you became director? Uh, so I think that uh, there was a, you know, you'd have to examine the Wen Ho Lee incident from um, soup to nuts to really understand this long-term impact. So Wen Ho Lee as a national security issue and then at Los Alamos came at the end of the Cold War. And so in 1992, when President Bush agreed to have a testing moratorium and there was a new president coming in and the discussion that maybe the laboratories should be paying a peace dividend, uh, it was a tumultuous time. You know, is there a mission for a strategic deterrent at the same time you're doing these other things. And Los Alamos saw a significant drop in employment and in budget. And then on top of all that, as this kind of chaotic mix is going on, uh, we have the story of uh, an employee that may have uh, inappropriately given material uh, to the People's Republic of China. That investigation was very, very serious, but it had to be looked at in terms of this whole impact of what are the national labs all about? Do they really all about national security or are they just academics in the end? And so um, I think that uh, the normal, really uh, appreciative handshake between like the way Los Alamos works and then counter espionage, uh, investigations like from the FBI was broken. And that breaking of that actually caused huge um, implications at Los Alamos that are still felt today. Um, a mistrust of, you know, are we being held to some other kind of standard? But at the same time, um, it was part of this landmark change, you know, national change, why we had national labs, why we do these kinds of things. So certainly by the time uh, I was director of Winho Lee, it faded in the sense of the person, but not necessarily in terms of looking at us. There was another aspect to that too, is that of course I got caught up in the whole issue of a large number of incredibly talented scientists that came to the United States from the People's Republic of China. And many of them chose to stay. That was the standard thing when they left in the 80s and the 90s. In particular, many of them chose to become U.S. citizens. But uh, there was a sense that, you know, can we trust a person which comes from another country to be completely um, an American when it comes to national security? And so I think the question is probably a bit facetious when I say it that way, but it has cast that shadow. We were the first where we have a person with a, uh, a strong connection to a country which became an adversary, even though it was a Taiwan connection and so on. But, uh, and we're certainly really still struggling as with all academic institutions right now. What does it mean? Um, you know, you, the director of the FBI just three weeks ago said, China is our biggest adversary for espionage. And unfortunately that word China sometimes gets translated to particular people rather than to a country. Terry, in what ways do you remain connected in your emeritus status to the laboratory? So um, I have a couple things that I continue to work on that are on the intelligence side. And um, much of that's been co-opted recently because uh, I've been asked to work on a few other things that uh, have to do with our presence situation. And I also, uh, I have several groups that are uh, working to mentor. What does it mean when you're a scientist at Los Alamos? So that, you know, it's trivial to say that, but the fact of the matter is that uh, our science heritage and the importance of excellence in science is extremely important in Los Alamos. But it's not the same as being a professor at Caltech, for example, um, in that you're going to be asked to do a lot of research, but we're also really going to be careful about what you can publish. 
And um, often the expectation of a young staff member at Los Alamos is that it's some like university, but with high, high fences. But it's actually quite different. And uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, actually trying to to mentor why that, you know, what we do and how it's important and how that also can uh, be a, a very successful and meaningful career. Now, Terry, for you, going all the way back to the beginning, Los Alamos has been a family business for quite some time. Tell me about your connections going all the way back to childhood. Yeah, so my father was uh, uh, put through school by the ROTC way back in the uh, 50s, and he got his PhD at at uh, Iowa State at Ames. He's a uranium chemist, and Los Alamos was, became our home. And so um, I actually grew up you know, in Los Alamos when it was a closed city. Um, I didn't know any better, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I thought things were kind of strange, you know, but our city, I mean, you had to go through a gate, right? And then later on, it's like in Los Alamos, uh, we were a federal reservation. So we were on daylight savings time in 1959 <laughs> and the rest of New Mexico wasn't. And so as a young child, that's uh, incredibly painful because all the television shows are at the wrong time. And you know, the guy that's just living across the Mesa has a different uh, different bedtime than you do. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the opportunities that come from that kind of thing are extraordinary. I mean, you know, until you really leave and, and go somewhere else, do you have any idea how fortunate you are? I mean, uh, you know, I had a differential equation class in high school because somebody, the laboratory was willing to teach something like that. You know, we didn't have advanced placement or anything. This person just wanted to be able to teach the differential equation. So we got a chance to do a whole lot of kinds of things like that. We refer to Los Alamos as being uh, on the world's longest cul-de-sac. It was built, you know, for secure reasons, but it also gave you a tremendous opportunity to be uh, in the wilderness you know, on the first declared super volcano. And so, um, you know, that's part of the mix. It's a great place. Uh, great opportunity, wonderful climate. But until you leave, do you really understand that? When I later in life, when I hired people, I can immediately tell, no, not immediately, but I can often tell relatively short whether they're going to actually be successful or enjoy Los Alamos. And so we have the world's greatest ultra running community, right? So everybody that's really successful at Los Alamos, not everybody, but many, love the outdoors, love to run ultra races, love to do ski. We have our own ski hill five minutes from downtown. Never snows anymore because of climate change, but nevertheless, we have all these kinds of things. And uh, you, there, there is a personality at Los Alamos uh, that remains even today. It's distinctly different than for Livermore, for example. And uh, I find that uh, really interesting and that tells you something about the people that are there. And to get back to your question is that uh, the opportunities that were there are framing. They make you uh, important part of making who you become. Terry, was your father engaged in classified work? Was he able to talk about his career at all when you were a kid? Uh, so, uh, yeah, he was engaged in classified work. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that uh, his group is the first group that actually built a, a line which refined and, and uh, collected tritium. And, of course, that's an important part of uh, the modern nuclear arsenal. But it was still different. So my father uh, was a very generous and quiet man, but he, I, I could actually, you know, go to his work sometimes, which is bizarre, right? And so um, I did my first x-ray on a mineral when I was a junior in high school. Um, you know, New Mexico is all nuclear, right? It's got the laboratory, it's got the waste deposit down in WIP, down by Carlsbad, but it also was the largest producer of uranium in the 60s and 70s. And the largest of those mines is by Grants, New Mexico was, it's called the Jack Powell Mine. And my father being the uranium specialist got this call. We got something that we don't quite know what it is. And so my father uh, made arrangements, you know, to get the material and then says, why don't you work on this? It's about time you learn how to do an x-ray. Okay, that's only a Los Alamos kind of thing, right? <laughs> so now uh, you do an x-ray on a material, and at that time you compare it to films of all these other x-rays. And I'm out there and I'm very studious about doing this. And the x-ray matches a thing called coffinite. 
I look up what coffinite is, and it's very radioactive, right? So it's like, my father knew, and he made me do coffinite. Turns out it's named after a mineralogist named Coffin, so it's not nearly as bad as thinking about being six feet under. <laughs> but, um, you know, being able to interact with him in that way was spectacular. But it's not just him. All the neighbors were the same. I mean, it was, uh, you know, again, I don't know what it would be to grow up somewhere else, but uh, if you had a question or you had something, you know, my life was experimenting. I got in trouble because my father taught us how to make frozen Crisco balls that you could light on fire, make Tygo and slingshots and shoot them over. And I let, lit the neighbor's hay field on fire by accident. Um, but I was the norm, not the exception. That's an entire set of generation of youth were like that. Terry, I'm curious, in the late 60s and early 70s, was, was Los Alamos more conservative? Did it see anti-war oh. protests and things like that? It was, it, it's all, it's, it was more conservative. Um, so I can remember uh, certainly in 1968 when the uh, Vietnam War was, the decision was, are you going to ramp up and try to finish it? What are you going to do? Uh, that election was incredibly contentious. And uh, there were protests, as I, I can remember in school, but they were not, they were mine. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1972 election, though, I was in high school and I was um, in social studies. I was one of the election monitoring officials. So the school gets to vote, all the kids, right? And uh, the, my social studies teacher, which was a woman named Mrs. Williams, was very liberal. And Nixon won by 12 votes in high school, right? And just watching this interaction, again, there's no context. You don't really understand this until you get, you know, uh, a life to look back on it. Um, but it obviously was much more conservative than almost anywhere else you can imagine. And, but the reasons were different. You know, the reason was, well, if we don't, you know, if we don't elect Nixon, then uh, we're going to go to war with China which was a discussion at the time. And of course, China got opened up. I mean, it was, but uh, it definitely there was that. Um, on the other hand, Earth Day was a big deal in Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was quite this um, meaningful discussion. Um, you know, as I said, it's a special place, but the military reservation was there. When I grew up as a Boy Scout, we didn't collect aluminum cans to raise money. We went to Bio Canyon, a canyon there, and collected depleted uranium ordnance <laughs> that had been shot into the mountain, and we dug it out. By weight, you get a lot more money by digging up depleted uranium ordnance than you can aluminum cans. <laughs> and so, but, you know, there was also the feeling that you should be doing this to clean up. So it was, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say it is just the word conservative or just liberal. My mother was the uh, uh, legislator that, represented the Los Alamos area in a much larger area also in New Mexico's uh, house for 22 years. And uh, she was a Republican, but she was routinely, um, they tried to primary her all the time because she wasn't conservative enough. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was, it was a mix in that sense. Terry, in going to the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, is that to say that even in high school you had interests veering toward geology and, and, and geophysics? I think so. I, so, um, you know, the, the, I, I, I was either going to be a physicist, a mathematician or a geophysicist. And it wasn't clear because I wanted to do all of them. Right. And I wanted to go to Caltech as an undergraduate, but, um, I was the oldest of five children. And, uh, my parents said, you know, you can go there for graduate school. That's the place to go for graduate school. Let's stay in state. You can help us on some other things. And I was disappointed at first, but it turned out to be the best decision I could have made and made me well prepared for Caltech. But I went down and I interviewed with a professor to see if I could work there. And he happened to be a Caltech graduate. His name was Alan Sanford. And uh, he was from the Seismolab. And I said, well, I think I would like to you know, be a geophysicist. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, because I really like physics and I like math and geology is really interesting. He says, no, nah, it sounds like you don't really know what you want to do. So I ended up getting all those degrees <laughs> just to show it. But uh, it was uh, it was, again, you know, a small place, not unlike Caltech, in which the focus is technology, science, 
and it gave me the chance to do that. Also got to be outdoors. I mean, it's, a, it's in the middle of nowhere and uh, there's a strong mining heritage. So, you know, you could actually go to the uh, hardware store and buy dynamite and store it under your dorm bed, which probably is not a great thing, but you, know, you could go collect minerals. And uh, I made, made uh, money to, uh, to supplement my uh, time at New Mexico Tech doing that. And it was just, uh, wow, I'm really, really fortunate that I got all these things together, even though at the time, I couldn't recognize the, uh, the thread of serendipity. Terry, for the graduating class, I'm curious if you have a, sen a sense what the rough breakdown was, students that went on into industry and those that went into graduate school. Uh, so I know that in my graduating class at New Mexico Tech today, so it's, it's a long time since I graduated, but I know today 60% have an advanced degree. But... Um, you know, the emphasis in New Mexico Tech being things earth or physics or petroleum, uh, most of the, my colleagues when they first graduated went to work for extraction or um, geologic things writ large, whether it be hydrology and so on. And many of them then went back to school afterwards. And for you, was it always going to be Caltech for graduate school? Was that the plan from Absol the beginning? Absolutely. Although I applied to a bunch of them because you're always worried that somehow you won't measure up, right? Um, but uh, I was really fortunate. Again, like I said, I had this, my advisor, uh, which I was close to, Al Sanford. I told him I really want to go to Caltech. And he, he told me some of the ins and outs to do that. But I applied to everywhere. And then you get this letter and you're all happy. But the day I showed up at Caltech in uh, the summer of uh, 78, within an hour in my little cubby kind of office while they were trying to figure out where we're going to be in South Mud, Clarence Allen showed up. Oh, wow. Which is a spectacularly famous professor, right? And uh, and my uh, advisor had called him and said, this guy's coming, you know, I mean, you're going to be, and could you look out for him? And they were colleagues back when they were in school. And uh, I developed a fantastic relationship with uh, Clarence because of that. And it was, uh, there was no looking back after that. Terry, as an undergraduate, I wonder if you were following all of the revolutions that were happening in seismology at that point. If you were aware of, you know, the debates about plate tectonics and earthquake prediction. So it was certainly a spectacular time. And at New Mexico Tech, I took a class called plate tectonics by Kent Condy, one of the first guys to do that. And it was great. But it took me being a graduate student to understand that a framing paradigm of plate tectonics ex was an attempt to explain everything. And, you know, what a remarkable thing. I mean, it was a revolution. So when I was an undergraduate and focusing on seismology and math and so on, it, it was interesting and earthquakes were interesting, but they were in some ways you know, individual things. They were isolated disciplines and not part of a theory to explain everything earth. And so I, I, I mean, I could feel it, but not really. But the day you walk into the Seismo lab and you go to a coffee, you suddenly realize that from the center of the core to the edge of the solar system is all a framed paradigm that was being discussed at that time. And there was not a day that I didn't feel excitement uh, once I got to Caltech. I wish I would have maybe felt that when I was an undergraduate, but it was it was just, you know, there is no other time in earth science uh, like the mid to late 70s to 1990, in which everything was there to be explained from what the core was made of to where uranium was to why earthquakes happened to the where they were to basically isotope geochemistry. Can we actually see where we came from in the stars? And it was all about one theory. What a spectacular time. Terry, being a triple major as an undergraduate, how well formed were your ideas coming to the Seismo Lab about what you wanted to specialize in? Or were you wide open? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. I knew I wanted to do seismology, and um, um, but... You know, at that time, and I believe it's probably still the same thing for graduate school, you had to you had to work with multiple professors and then defend this kind of thesis propositions. 
And so you were forced to kind of to work with different people. And uh, the first person that I worked with was actually a guy named Bernard Minster. And he was um, Caltech under, I mean, he got his degree at Caltech and stayed on. And the question was, when I look at a map, I see more left-handed transform faults than right-handed. Why? He says, so that's your, you need to tell me why. I'm like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it, it allowed me to do all of my background. I got to do statistical and hypothesis testing. And then I got to think about, uh, you know, from the standpoint of geology, how do you really identify? Are we missing something? Is there a gap there? And then you think about the, the seismology. You know, you have certain kind of earthquakes, strikes up earthquakes out under the ocean where you can't observe them. And so having all that suddenly, you know, things which I thought were uh, fun all became coordinated. Um, and so that was really great. My second, uh, you know, the reason seismology was at Caltech is because they had earthquakes in California, right? But after the, you know, the big earthquake in 1952 up at, uh, you know, in the Mojave, it kind of died. And uh, so, I mean, it was it was kind of a science that people weren't really sure it was really important, right? Oh, you had the Alaskan earthquake in 1964. And then finally, 1971, you have San Fernando. But nothing happens after San Fernando. And so in 1978, there was a little earthquake in Santa Barbara. And so that was my second proposition, model that, you know. And so I got to be able to do that too. And I really enjoyed that. I didn't really care that much about the results of what the earthquake looked like, but being able to exercise, uh, you know, basically a, a theoretical problem of uh, inversion and being able to do something was fantastic. And then my last proposition actually was uh, uh, mineral related, and I got to uh, I got to work with uh, uh, people in the other part of the department, and it was it was great. It was it was really fun. Now defending those propositions in front of your peers, not not the professors who cares about them, but you have to do it in front of your peers, was it was an extraordinarily uh, stressful time, but uh, it was great. Terry, of course, this was after your time, but did you feel any generational connectedness to the old Seismo Lab, the, ma the mansion in the hills? Would you hear yeah, so stories, still, get a sense about it? So we still had that, San Rafael, when I was first there, and we still went up to read records. And so there's these stacks of uh, seismic records that had come from all around the world, not only just the Caltex, but, you know, if you had ordered a seismogram for the Alaskan earthquake, it was stored up there. And so you could feel that. But at the same time, you know, we had, I mean, Charles Richter still came into the lab. And so you would see this, you know, and of course my undergraduate textbook in seismology was Richter. So you, you, you had this sense of connectiveness that goes all the way through that. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, the mansion was pretty cool, but it was Going to the Athenaeum at lunch and being at the table next to Feynman trumps yeah. the fact that you could be down in San Rafael. <laughs> now, did Minster, was he your thesis advisor? No, my thesis advisor was Don Helmberger. Uh -huh. And I was a perfect advisor for me. He was a rel relatively young faculty member. And so he was my second proposition working on uh, uh, the Santa Barbara earthquake. And we we were well matched in many ways. And so... Um, you know, he's, uh, he's had a tremendous impact on many, many, uh, students. And I was one of the very early ones, maybe the third. And what was Helmberger working on at that point? So I think he was working on every wiggle and every seismogram, to yeah. be perfectly honest. Um, but, um, when I went there, you know, after the working on the earthquake, I said, I don't really kind of really earthquakes or earthquakes. What I want to do is, you know, some theoretical thing. I want to rewrite the theoretical work you did as uh, uh, for your PhD, but take advantage of the fact that we're entering the computer age. How can I take advantage of a mathematical background and think about, well, approximations for Bessel functions, use the Sterling formula. I mean, all these kinds of things and make, be able to do that. And he said, okay, why don't you work on uh, what we call regional distance seismographs? So things that are few hundred kilometers to a few thousand kilometers long, in which vibrations in the crust are really important. And it so happened that we had a huge archive of those records associated with all the large scale U.S. nuclear tests. And so my main thing was then 
developing the theoretical tools and then modeling U.S. nuclear tests to see how much can I actually get out of that record that tells me what that nuclear weapon is really like. And of course, the rest is history in terms of uh, uh, setting up me for my career. What was your thesis on? Was it those projects put together or did you do something separate for the defense? No, so my, my thesis was called long, long Period Regional Body Waves. And so it included those things. Uh, I mean, it was very much focused on mathematical tools and the nuclear forensics, if you will. Um, but I also, uh, there was a series of earthquakes that occurred in 1980 at Mammoth Lakes. So we finally got some more earthquakes. And then, of course, as we were getting ready to look at those earthquakes, Mount St. Helens goes off. Nobody cares about earthquakes anymore. But uh, they were the same month and everything. It was just days apart. Um, and so I had papers on some earthquakes like that. But it was, you know, the, the magic of the thesis versus doing the work is sometimes uh, lost. And, you know, Don Helmberger and his students, in particular, uh, my colleague and uh, classmate Thorn Lay happened to be his students to be working on kind of nuclear explosion stuff. And most people don't realize that most money in seismology between 1959 and 1985 came from the Department of Defense. It did not come from NSF. It did not come from. And so we would go to these conferences, huge conferences to look at, you know, um, seismology as a verification tool and monitoring at the time the Soviets and things like that. And Don would be there, and my first experience, of course, would be some paper we'd work on then, and we'd get up there, and it's a little screen, 100 people, and he says, I'll put your slides on. And he would always just go to the slide he was interested in. What it taught me to be was impromptu, but to have to tell a story about every single thing. And that was incredibly meaningful to me later in life, understanding what that was. And that's that's one of the values of Don being uh, perhaps uh, myopic in terms, of, I need to understand every wiggle, but it, every opportunity was to, okay, maybe I should be thinking about this. Terry, is that to say that even in graduate school with your awareness of the relevance of seismology for nuclear weapons testing, did you make an intellectual connection between that scholarly pursuit and possibly working in the field of national security? Yeah, I think so. I think, so I would also include then Dave Harkrider. So he was a, our theoretical geophysicist at the time. And in uh, 1979, there was a mysterious explosion off the southern coast of South Africa. We call it event 747. And Hark Rider came into my office and said, I, I got something for you to go work on, but you can't talk about it. And I worked on the gravity waves, the lifting of the atmosphere and coming back down. So sort of like what we hear today when we have a large Tonga uh, eruption. And I collected all this esoteric pressure gauge from weather station data to be able to look on that, to be able to say something about if that was an explosion or not. And of course, it went away and I never got to talk about that. But uh, it, it made me realize that the Earth is on all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible series of cameras and recorders. And we can see both natural phenomena and man-made phenomena. And uh, that was very much a turning point. Terry, I'm curious if JPL was an interface for you at all. If there was anything happening in the world of geodesy or elsewhere, elsewhere that was relevant for what you were doing. So not, not specific JPL, but geodesy is really important. So another Caltech... Uh, uh, graduate, slightly older than me, Jim Whitcomb, was very interested in the Palmdale Bulge. Okay, and that came and gone in terms of this, but the idea there was maybe developing GPS-type instruments. Mm -hmm. And I think that by 1981 or 82, as we began to talk about this, it was really clear that we should eventually be able to do seismology from space. And of course, today we're doing things at, like at Caltech on INSAR, in which we look at satellite differences and be able to tell small amounts of displacement and even do it in almost near real time in some cases. And that, that was, we could see that at that time. Um, similarly, Kip Thorne was walking around in 79 and 80 trying to find some seismologists that would be able to use 
uh, seismic stations at the two poles to be able to look at stretching or squeezing the earth to look for gravity waves, right? I mean, the clocks were too bad at that time. Yeah. But all those things were pointing to the, a future in which when we put all this together, it was only technology bound and technology we eventually receive. We'd be able to look at the earth as essentially a living organism changing dimensions how does it affect its climate all these kinds of things and you could just see this in the early 80s it was going to come and here we are 40 years later and we're definitely in another really exciting era for the seismo lab in that uh i mean the impact of humans or climate or vibrations of the eiger all these kinds of things are things we can see in exquisite detail today and uh, we could see it in the 80s but we couldn't we, we weren't there yet terry you mentioned how the growth of computational power allowed for some new possibilities what were the computers you were working with at that point what did they look like what could you do as a result so we used the caltech computer and so you had to you know to begin with and so you would uh, when i wrote my code which was a rework of what don Helmberger had done. He had his code to do what we call ray theories, called A series. I rewrote it as the D hoopster. There's a thing in there. We also play basketball. But you would carry your four boxes of cards across um, the campus, and the computer center is sort of where the student uh, center is today. And then you would basically go the next day to get your output, this big stack of output. And, uh, you know, the greatest fear of every scientist or computational scientist at that time was tripping because i mean there's just no way you're going to get those cards back in right order uh rob clayton showed up at the seismo lab and he brought our first significant computer resource that we all could use it was a prime computer okay it was a terrible machine but nevertheless it moved us to being able to write our own programs and have them self-stored and what an exciting time that really was. It was great to be able to do that and get away from the cards, turn the cards into Christmas trees, whatever you're going to be able to do. Um, but it is fairly amazing the things we could do by just running a computer code over and over. But today I can write a little, you know, Perl script on my iPhone that does way more than I used to be able to do on that whole uh, computer set. But having Rob Clayton come and bring that first computer into the into the seismo lab was uh it's it's a landmark terry being at the seismo lab right at the time when data was becoming sort of more democratized more widely shared was your sense that the seismo lab was still a magnet that it would be a place where outside researchers would want to come and share ideas and look at data uh, it was it was the strongest magnet you can believe and again, I had to leave to really understand how strong that magnet was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, part of the cook's ingredient to that was, of course, the absolute demand by Don Anderson that, that every graduate student go to coffee twice a day, right? And that the topics would not be what you're working on unless called upon and that sits. So you you were informed on everything that's going on from Tom Aaron's talking about shocking materials and what that may mean for the Earth's core to Hiro Kanemori bringing out the record from some historical earthquake, talking about, well, we just had a little earthquake in the same spot. What does that really mean? Uh, just there was a, you know, there was a heady elixir and it attracted others. So, you know, the famous paper that helped really launch the paradigm of plate tectonics, one of the co-authors was Lynn Sykes. Lynn Sykes came and visited for a semester when I was here. Anton Hales, Adam Zerwanski, um, Kayaki came several times from MIT. They all came to Caltech. And as far as I could tell, nobody from Caltech went to their institution. I don't know that's really true, but it was, it was amazing. Everybody came there. And it was, you know, they share exchange ideas, the, the data, but it was the elixir of the intellectual exchange that was just so great. I've seen, and I tried when I went and started at the University of Arizona to rebuild that. There's, there's nothing like it was in the 70s to early 80s at Caltech. It was just 
it was it was intoxicating. Terry, coming from a, a humble place, presumably as a graduate student, looking back at your thesis research, did you feel like you were representing a particular school of thought in seismology, given the narrative of all of the debates that were swirling around at that time? That's a really good question. I think that more, normally I would have said no, but it was really interesting because seismology was trying to catch up on the computational standpoint, and some some Caltech grads had left her earlier. And so there was a lot of debate uh, on certain kinds of topics. And one of those topics is what we call the size of uh, the yield wars. Strange term, but were the Russians cheating with their yields mm -hmm. in their seismic tests? So the threshold test ban treaty in 76 said you can't be above 150 kilotons. Uh, we crafted that uh, with really bad intent because that was the maximum size you could have without shaking Howard Hughes's uh, residents in downtown Las Vegas. Really, that's where that number comes from. But we had people trying to say, well, the yield from a seismology is this, but it depended on the waves you used. Did you use the surface waves? Did you use the P waves? You know, and um, it was pretty intense trying to understand, like, how much do they attenuate in the earth? So we had these intense debates between people like Paul Richards, who's now at Columbia, he was at Columbia at that time, about what's the attenuation factor in the earth versus a Don Helmberger. And uh, I mean, they were, they were, as, as, at least as a scientist, me, very personal. And so it's not quite the question that you asked, but I will tell you that the debates, you were representing, you know, an evolving field, but you may be wrong because we still haven't figured out, you know, what the attenuation and so on was. Um, but I, I view that, that that was part of, again, the recipe to making this a fantastic time. I don't think that I had to represent Los Alamos or represent New Mexico Tech. I didn't think that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I did think that I, I do know that whether I liked it or not, I couldn't embarrass Helmberger. Now, I don't think he could, he was embarrassable. <laughs> but there was a part of that that was, uh, you know, you did, you definitely didn't want to embarrass Helmer, or you never want to embarrass Don Anderson. No. So. In addition to Helmberger, who else was on your thesis committee? So Don Anderson, Hiro Kanamori, Don Helmberger, um, and then I had, uh, uh, we had a planetary science with Dewey Mullman, and uh, uh, I had Burnett from uh, Geochemistry Science. Mm -hmm. Don Burnett. Yeah. Terry, when you defended thinking about your next opportunity, were you always focused on faculty positions? Did you think about government service at that point or even perhaps entering industry? So I thought I would probably, well, first of all, I think a failing of the education at that time and part of the excitement was uh, there's a strong, strong, there was a strong tendency, and I still think that there's a little prejudice to this, to produce as a faculty member at Caltech, somebody that looks like you. Yeah. And the measure to that success then is you should be a faculty member like me. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the university you should be that. And so I felt that pressure. I didn't view it as negative, but that's all my classmates all felt that same kind of pressure. And so we all are competing for academic jobs. Uh, and I went and did the academic thing and succeeded just fine in Arizona, but it was not what I actually... I didn't feel like I was contributing to something larger. And uh, I'm really fortunate I got to go home, right, to Los Alamos and do these these things. But um, I will tell you that the, the mark of success when we graduated, my class graduated in 82 and 83, was to show that you had an academic, you know, professorship. And uh, I regret that feeling a little bit. I think I could have contributed more in other ways. Um, and I, th I don't blame anybody for that, but it is, it is a natural tendency when you're a faculty member to want to make a faculty member, I mean, make somebody that looks like you, right? That's how you teach them. And uh, one of the accoutrements to that is, well, you're an assistant, an associate, and then a full professor, and then maybe a regents professor or something like that. And so that, that's, that's got to be the ladder for success. And I still think we have a little bit of problem, you know, in a lot of places in understanding 
well, are you a full professor? Oh, you're a government scientist? Yeah, well, I've been fortunate to be able to see all kinds. And I can tell you that, uh, yeah, you know, the uh, the first adjective on that government versus academic is not the real uh, key. Terry, I'm curious if Frank Press being science advisor to Jimmy Carter, if that registered with you at all, if that made you think about public service at any point. Certainly did. And so Frank came several times. I mean, he's from Caltech, right? And uh, several times. And interestingly, you know, small world that we live, when I was recruited to go to Los Alamos from Arizona, the director of science and technology there, which is the job I got in six, was Frank Press's son, Bill Press. And, uh, you know, it very much, you know, the that whole relationship. I mean, Frank, there's no, there's no more Frank Presses. Okay. I mean, he was, a, he had tremendous sway, not only with science policy, but reminding everyone that's actually every policy question has a science mm-hmm. annex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he was just a tremendous person in that way. And I think he influenced actually a lot of people, including me, uh, to be able to do that. But then to have his son and is here as the director of science and technology at Los Alamos, it, uh, it, it was definitely a reinforcement. Now, at the University of Arizona, is there an analog to the Seismo Lab, a, a separate institute, or is it part of the geology department? Yeah, so it's part of the geology or earth science program. Um, I, I'm like m- many of the people that graduated from my time. We set up a Seismo Lab kind of thing. So we had Southern Arizona Seismic Observatory. We had our set of seismic stations, and you know, we're the first web page on uh uh, most of the sciences there, you know, which would have an active earthquake map and so on. And I think that that's actually was fairly common in the, in the day to be able to do that. Um, but it was, you know, and again, we had a couple seismologists and uh, all we tried to make sure that they all had different disciplines so that we covered the, but there's nothing like Caltech. I mean, we, you know, we had uh, the governor set up a you know, a seismic board, and I was the chair of this for Arizona and so on, again, to try to provide public information. Um, because there's always going to be, you know, if you have a little earthquake in the Grand Canyon, what does it mean? And everybody wants to be able to know that. Um, so um, those kinds of things were there. But, you know, it remains unique, in my opinion, the seismic lab, uh, different today, but still as an entity. And I know that. Um, you know, should it remain an entity? It's always been a discussion, but I think that uh, there's nothing else that's ever been quite like that. Now, was your hire part of a broader effort at Arizona to beef up the seismology program? Not really. It was the realization that quantitative geoscience was the future. Mm-hmm. And so Arizona always had a fairly strong geology program, but, you know, if you were to look at their rankings, which they didn't really have at the time, they'd be number one in field geology. I'm very proud of that. But of course, it's really important, but that's, you know, we were in this era when people were asking, you know, the question is, can I look at a light oxygen isotope to tell me about climate change? We were already asking that kind of question or the quantitative question is, what does the upper mantle really look like? Can it explain why we have the Rocky Mountains? And so it was it was the effort to be quantitative, maybe not to be seismologists, but to be quantitative in the next generation of earth science. Terry, to foreshadow to your time at Los Alamos, what were some of the interactions you had in the national science policy world, the AGU being in Washington that may have served as a stepping stone to to the national lab? So, you know, uh, being a Helmberger student and going to every one of these meetings, which were the national forum for things like uh, what uh, what we were trying to do from a treaty perspective, opened lots of doors. And uh, at the same time, um, we had had 100 years of seismology, but uh, the instruments that had been deployed, and most of them, like the Worldwide Seismic Network, were deployed because of questions about nuclear explosions after the late 50s. They were pretty antiquated. And so um, between Harvard, UC San Diego, and Caltech, uh, there was this movement to make a consortium to be able to um, 
revitalize the instrumentation in seismology. And this was IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institutes for Seismology. And uh, I was one of the founding members. We just happened to be, you know, it's an age thing almost. It's one of those serendipity things. And so uh, to be able to be part of IRIS when it was founded and I was on the committee to work on instrumentation, um, again, opened lots of doors to that. I later became chairman of IRIS. I was the uh, president of the Seismological Society of America. I was on the government committee for the AGU that wrote the first uh, question when Clinton asked about, uh, can we verify a, a comprehensive test ban? And so all those things came together from, um, really, I would say the birth was the fact that we had antiquated instruments back in the 80s and we we're trying to figure out how to solve a problem and suddenly we were all be able to do that. But many of my colleagues were in the same boat. We, we were very much instrumental in setting national security uh, technology, if not full policy in the 90s and uh, beginning of this millennium. Terry, as a faculty member at University of Arizona, all of this consulting work, was it open source? Did you need a clearance for any of this? So, it, you know, I think that that's a great question. Um, at Arizona, you couldn't, like many universities, you couldn't do classified work on site. Right. Now, that's changed a little bit. So on. But I would often go spend my summer in Los Alamos. Uh -huh. And so um, I was, or I would go down to uh, AFTEC, the Air Force Technical Applications Laboratory, or uh, a center down in uh, Florida to work on specific problems. And so uh, one of the marvelous, I guess it's marvelous, marvelous things about the academic also is that, you know, you're uh, involved in teaching and research, but you also have this thing called the summer in which you can, uh, you know, go, um, or at least I took the opportunity to work on uh, different kinds of sets of problems. Terry, I'm curious, in the course of your 20 years of tenure at Arizona, if there's a moment that sticks out in your memory when you decided you want to take the leap into, into national security work. Yeah, I think it was certainly by 1992, I had gotten the McElwain Medal at that time in the AGU, and I thought that was pretty nice, but it was like, you know, this academic thing is really interesting, but what I'm doing in the summer makes a difference yeah. to me. Yeah. And so I knew that I was going to leave. It took me another 10 years to, to do that, to leave. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that um, when we, when President Bush announced the cessation of testing in September of 1992, and we did an experiment, which was a chemical explosion, could we tell there's a chemical nuclear explosions, it was called a chemical kiloton, or a non-proliferation non experiment, it was clear that die was cast. And I knew that I would be there. I didn't know when, uh, but uh, uh, it was clear that that was my path, long-term path. I'll just note that 1992, it's a year after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In what ways did the end of the Cold War register for you and make you think differently about national security and nuclear weapons testing? Uh, so good question is that, uh, so we had this, you know, the dissolution, and there was lots of discussions about what, what would become of the Soviet Union. Um, but at the same time, we began to see the rise of other nuclear powers. And so uh, China tested in, in 96 before they did this uh, cessation, and it was big. 92 and 96, they had big tests. So we, you know, it didn't seem like it was, you know, it was always going to be the one existential threat mm -hmm. from a human weapon perspective. Um, so it, it actually made the question more compelling because we were going to go from this kind of bipolar world to multipolar world where maybe many states would have nuclear weapons. And the dissolution also told us that maybe the Soviets would see their nuclear expertise spread across the world. And in fact, it did. Yeah. But maybe not just the expertise, maybe the material. And so we began to ask a whole bunch of questions about improvised nuclear devices. How, how might we, you know, monitor for that? It's not necessarily a specific seismology question, but it's a great science question. Can you see plutonium from afar? Can you see uranium? It's really hard. But, you know, what are the telltale signs? What's the patterns of life? 
All these kinds of things were really big questions. And I was very interested in that. This is also the birth of everything was real time. So the internet was there, right? So if you have an earthquake, Iris had a few stations and you didn't have to go into any laboratory. You could do it from home on the computer to do something about the size of that earthquake and what it meant. Well, if you could do that, if you have somebody have an accidental explosion, the sinking of the Kursk, the Russian submarine in 2001, in 2000, could we see that on a seismometer in real time in our own laboratory? And it really was this, you know, it was the falling apart of the Soviet Union, but at the same time, we're able to be able to see everything in real time and begin to ask the question about, is the whole world a neighborhood watch? That it really changed the way we looked at the world in terms of those kind of questions. Terry, in 2001, even before you joined Los Alamos, I wonder how 9-11 changed your thinking about international security, and if you appreciated at that time just how important the DOE National Lab System would be in this new era. That's a great question in terms of the way thinking about uh, So 9-11, I happened to be in Washington that time, and I'd been in the Pentagon the day before 9-11, not on the side of the building that was uh, hit by the, uh, uh, the airliner. But... Um, it took forever to get back home, by the way, but um, it, it was it was surreal from an emotional standpoint. But when you really began to look and ask the questions, you realized it there was a there's a huge technology implication. How could we have stopped this? What was the technology? And so it 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 was a profound to me, mm -hmm. um, you know rather juvenilely, you know, it changed that I had my first artificial hip in 1998. I was only 42 years old. And um, when I came to Washington, the first time I could fly after 9-11, it was really hard for anybody to believe I had an artificial hip. They had metal detectors. They made me take my pants all the way off. You know, I mean, it was just nobody knew how to. And it was a realization we're in a different world. And so we're going to have to think about technological solutions to questions which we didn't think about as being asked mm -hmm. just this year before. And uh, yes, it framed the national labs, what we do. And uh, like I said, you know, mo we'll never talk about all the interdiction to all the nefarious activities that have come from inventions at national laboratories, but they're numerous. And uh, we wouldn't have been thinking about that the same way at all if 9-11 hadn't happened and hadn't had the visceral experience. I, I was visibly shaken um, just because you, you have a standard way of thinking about things, yeah. you know, and your life is this way. If you went to an airport in 2000, you know, anybody could walk with you to the gate. And it was, you know, it was a totally different experience. But you should have recognized even at then, because we'd had hijackings and everything else, the fragility of human systems uh, is extraordinary. Terry, from the initial summer work at Los Alamos, when did the conversations reach a point of seriousness where you committed to actually joining the lab? So I think that the first time was in 1998. Um, and uh, 1998 was a similar year because that's the, both the Indians and the Pakistanis tested mm -hmm. in May of 1998. And so uh, I was offered a job at that time. I felt like I had too many loose ends um, at that time. And so it took me a couple of years to get all those loose ends and other things uh, wrapped up. Um, but I knew by then I would be back at Los Alamos. Now, again, you can't ever understand serendipity. I show up at Los Alamos to run some what we call black programs to do work on some. And uh, the lab's a little bit in turmoil. You mentioned Win Ho Lee, but we didn't get all those things straightened out. We had a big fire in New Mexico in uh, 2000. And um, when they tried to had to evacuate some buildings, they couldn't locate some nest uh, nuclear emergency response kind of disc. And it was just, it was turmoil right so when i got there right in this turmoil 
I suddenly went from having to do this program and say, no, you're going to be in charge of the Earth and Environmental Science Group, so a couple hundred people. And only a year and a half after that, I said, well, we really need you to do this. I mean, purely serendipity. Uh, and I couldn't have been that if I hadn't been an academic, by the way, because I saw the world differently than just being at the lab also. And so um, I knew that I was going to go in 98. I never would have guessed all these other things would happen. The path to becoming a director when you're not a nuclear physicist, I mean, it's never happened before. Yeah. And uh, but it was happening to be working on these problems. But then it was also the connections in time to all these different things from nuclear testing to um, Chinese colleagues, understanding what their program was and putting seismometers in China and all those things came together. Terry, of course, you can't predict the future, but was your sense that when you joined the lab, you were on a path to leadership from the beginning? I would say that no. I mean, I, you know, to be honest, I, I knew I was going to do something meaningful and interesting, um, but I couldn't have said I would have been the president of SSA. I couldn't have said <laughs> I would be, you know, the president of IRIS, all those kinds of things. Um so I, I there's probably there probably is a predisposition to seeking those kinds of things without recognizing it, but uh, it was never I I can't say I would identify a career ladder in any way. It was always about this is an interesting problem. So the driver is the solving the problem, and the rest is just condiments <laughs> as you go forward. <laughs> Terry, given your longstanding connections with the lab, both personally and professionally coming from a faculty position, what elements of the career transition was a soft landing and what was, you know, rather jagged? You had to learn it on the spot. Right. So I think the hardest thing to, for anybody to learn in this is that when you're an academic, this is a really interesting thing that goes on now. I'm not saying this goes on at Caltech because I'll get in. in Cal, but when you're an academic, you have to be important. You know, you have to write good papers, but you don't write them with the guy next door. Yeah. You're running with a person that's at a different institution. It's a strange, strange thing. When you become a scientist working on a problem at Los Alamos, it's the guy next door that you depend upon. Yeah. It's, and it, that's very different. Yeah. And I know that sounds maybe a little trivial, but you, you are, your community is those people in your hallway or in your facility. And you all succeed or fail together at a university it's you that succeeds or fails and if the guy next door to you doesn't get tenure it's not a black mark on you and so um i love the fact that you know we have to work together to do that but i didn't i don't think anybody makes that as easily as it, it would sound because um you know you're not going to be the first author on a paper you're not going to be you know you may want to pick to go work with somebody else but you got a problem you've got to solve and that problem can only be solved by the people that are next to you or in your laboratory that are going to be able to do that. Terry, what were your responsibilities and what was the reporting structure at your first job at the lab? So my first lab, I, I went to work on a black program. I got there the day of in the summer of, or spring of 2003 and I was to be, the title was deputy division leader. So it's you know, I mean, it's it's like 130 scientists and maybe 60 support staff. I was the deputy to that. But the day I did that, they took that division leader and assigned him to do something that was important. They said, so you're going to be the division leader. That didn't go over that well with the people in the division. Because, <laughs> you know, well, anyway. But uh, How much management so, experience could you have claimed at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I, I'd had graduate students. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, and the reporting structure then is up to what would be, we would call a principal associate director. And that time it was a guy named Tom Myers, a great chemist. And so that's probably a few thousand people is the... And then that goes to the director. And so uh, I suddenly was the division leader. And so I, I couldn't actually do the job I was meant to do there. But I, with a bomb, at least I tried to take over the division. But then we had a, in 2004, we, you know, this royal from Winho Lee and everything else, we had a safety incident. 
and they shut down the laboratory and they put in a new director. And this, he was an admiral. His name was Nanos. Pete Nanos. Yeah. And so uh, suddenly I was in his, his administration. They shut down the lab. Well, if you shut down a national lab, you have to bring it back by all these protocols and rules. You can't just say, okay, you're good to go. And, you know, frankly, I said, well, screw this. This is just stupid. I went out and hired somebody else, and we were the first division to stand back up. That galled Pete at the time. Okay, we became friends afterward, but it galled him at the time. Because it was like, well, no, we're not going to, I mean, we're going to go, we need to do work. We need to do the thing. And uh, what that did was said to UC when they get ready to compete the laboratory, well, this is a guy that's got to be, I was the only senior person on the Los Alamos that was on the bid team. And so, um, you know, all this is just, as I said, sort of serendipity. So when I became the bid team, I'm with people they're bidding to do the lab. So companies, Bechtel, and the Livermore people, like Mike Anastasio is, for, is the director of Livermore, right? Well, Los Alamos and Livermore don't exactly, they're not great siblings, right? So the first thing Mike is going to do, well, we're going to shut down this, shut down this, shut that. And I would, I'd lock him in the room until I convinced him he couldn't do that. And that's my biggest actually accomplishment of all of Los Alamos. I saved several things at Los Alamos. So nobody will ever really understand because if they bid, if they could just tell, oh, we're going to be a lot cheaper because we're going to shut down the neutron facility. Sound like a good idea. Or we're going to shut down our effort to do this computer called Roadrunner, which was a hybrid computer, the first one to break a petaflop, right? Livermore hates that idea, hated that idea. So they were going to shut it down, save money. And basically I was the thorn in their side, but I was a really deep thorn. I wouldn't be pulled. And so my job for as director of the science part was basically to make sure Anastasio didn't screw us up. And um, so, you know, when we say reporting structure, it's kind of a strange thing. And then when Mike left, uh, they wanted me to do uh, global security because we had some issues there and I was from this. And again, that reported to the new next director, which was Charlie McMillan. And uh, I, I took that well, but we had an accident in 19, I mean, 2014, in which a drum of what we call low level waste had an explosion down in WIP. And so it shut down the waste isolation project. And so I stepped away from being the director to be the recovery manager. And my whole time was politics then. Go to Carlsbad, tell them that's okay. Convince Ernie Moniz that we knew what we were doing. And, um, that turns out, I guess, you know, for my mother being a politician was my strong skill. Who would have known that particular <laughs> thing? And so, and that, that then when I got to come back, it was going to be a natural that I'd be the next director, but we had another competition. Terry, in your initial jobs at that Los Alamos, did you have opportunity to draw on your expertise in seismology or was it really administrative at that point from the beginning? No, so I did have a lot of opportunity. And, and uh, um, so, I, less of the work was done by me directly in seismology and more was directing people with seismology. But I had an encyclopedic knowledge of nuclear explosions, for example. So that had been developed in the, and I, I still opine, and I may, may not be right on this, but I think I've looked at more seismic records from nuclear explosions than anybody else. Now, um, you know, that's sort of like saying I've got the world's worst tattoo, too. But, um, it's the expertise of understanding that event or this event or, you know, are there records to be able to do this that pushed our research forward. But it uh, so it was a different phase. I still got to do things that were related to what I was doing, but in a different way. So I think that actually if I was honest in answering your question fully, I would say it was I was still doing more administrative, but I was getting to be in, if not hands-on, I was still directed towards seismology. When I became director, I mean, that's, you don't do any science. You have to understand a lot, but you, you don't do any science. Terry, in the run-up to becoming director, what is the involvement of, in Washington, D.C.? You mentioned Ernie Moniz, of course, Secretary of Energy to President Obama. What is the DOE, Washington in general, what role do they play? So it's a big role. Uh, so the most important thing that a director does, I mean, you can talk about running the laboratory and everything else, but you have to write a letter every year to the president of the United States that cannot be changed. 
that you certify the reliability and the safety and the effectiveness of the nuclear deterrent. It's a big deal. And so that goes directly to the president. Everybody wants you to change it along the way. Well, don't say that because they may not give us money for this or that, but you're, nobody can change your letter. So you directly go to the White House and that's Austin Livermore, that's a big, big deal. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, there is no such thing as there should be no such thing as nuclear weapons being in a political environment. So the consortium that decides that we need a strategic deterrent is actually broad, but quite fragile. And it is the director's job to be able to convince that, uh, group so senators and house members but senators are the most important in this that uh what's your you know that there's a reason for the deterrent and that you know how to do it safely economically environmentally friendly and uh, that is 50 percent of the job we talked about when ho lee of course one of the legacies of that is the creation of the nnsa what interface did you have with that agency or sub agency depending on how you look at it so, yeah, in NSA, we would view it as an agency because we had a lot less. I mean, you could see Ernie Moniz or Rick Perry or whatever. But the fact of the matter in NSA, you know, is, is your customer. The difficulty associated with this, and it was set up by, Sen you know, with the help of Senator Domenici, so that, you know, try to keep preservation here, is that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a job that they have a mission and they can't do it without the laboratories, but their mission is strangely hanging in space because it's a DOD mission. So, you know, if you go back to the original Atomic Energy Act, nuclear weapons are to be civilian control. And that's why we had the AEC, and then DOE, IRDA, and then NNSA. But the money comes from the Department of Defense's budget. So there's this constant struggle between the Department of Defense and STRATCOM. You know, we want this and we can deliver this from the NNSA perspective. And the peanut butter in that sandwich is the national labs. And so you, you, have, to, you have to be able to truly embrace the role of trying to do the right thing. So a federally funded FFRDC, right? But at the same time, know that you have to report to NSA, but you have to make DOD happy. And um, that's, it's, it's a pretty complicated thing to do. The first uh, director for me for NNSA was a guy named Linton Brooks. Uh, fantastic mind, especially on non-proliferation. But in general, it's been a position that's hard to find the right person to do. And uh, they have a great administrator today. Uh, which came from being director of a national laboratory but it's a real hard job and so you know um i would say very few people if they were honest would tell you that the relationship between a national lab and nnsa is smooth terry looking back what would you say your key achievements as director of los alamos were so i think the i mean um, others may disagree with this but the, my key thing is i believe we may we were the best technical intelligence laboratory in the world and that was my focus. So we had a mission associated with doing things on nuclear weapons, but I wanted to make sure that we were providing on the intelligence side, the best technical information possible about what the rest of the world was doing. And I really believe that we succeeded at that. Um, I also believe that uh, we helped move the national laboratories and DOE into the 21st century, even though it was 18 years afterwards. We were the first, I mean, it's a contract. And so everybody wants to make the contract small. You know, let's make it economic. I said that we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have uh, maternity leave. And the DOE said no. And so I blackmailed it. And the fact that I was able to get maternity leave for the first DOE laboratory and now all of them, of course, do, and all, lots of other things. I view that as actually the accomplishment. It was the people part. Uh, 
being able to uh, do those kinds of things. Again, that sounds sort of trivial, I know now, but it was not because they is, were not going. That is not true. I was a federal employee and that is not a trivial thing. And so those are the kinds of things that I think that I really help do. And I'm, I'm proud of, I'm very proud of that we could, we could uh, recognize that. And like I said, you know, uh, if the contract hadn't been expired, I probably wouldn't have had as much leverage for the blackmail. But nevertheless, uh, it was it was something that uh, I, I felt like that in, like I said, we changed the rest of the complex. Terry, given your emphasis on technical intelligence, if you can't or decide not to answer this question, I'll certainly understand. But does the National Laboratory's intelligence work interface directly in the 16-member IC? Or is the interface exclusively funneled through the DOE and then from there to the IC? So one of the members of the IC, of course, is DOE IN. Um, and so normally on paper, it looks like that we go through that. But in fact, it, it, it is um, directly to like in nuclear intelligence, um, you have the uh, nuclear intelligence committees, uh, INTIC, or you have the JAKE, Joint Atomic Energy Commission uh, is direct to those. Um, but there's a broader set of issues that come that are outside the, I mean, the UEIN is really important and they help set the stage, but there are many problems of national security imperative that don't go through the UEIN. And they go because they know Los Alamos, for example, can deliver a satellite that nobody else can. And uh, I'm very proud of that, but it is, it's a little bit of a source point too, because an FFRDC, you know, coming up. And so of course we get accused all the time of, well, you just want to build satellites, right? But uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, we're, we're able to provide a technical solution to problems that nobody else can. Terry, in your post laboratory life in public policy and science communication, you know, the American public, we have a very short attention span, and we might think that 9-11 is ancient history or things like that. How can you convey that it's not accidental that we haven't had a 9-11 again? How can you make the public appreciate that it's because of intelligence, it's because of verification, it's because of the hard work day in and day out that we're keeping our nation secure? So I think that you, you actually... Did my speech for me i mean we have to be able to communicate it at all times um because again the the attention span is short but um a war in ukraine has revitalized the whole concept that there's an existential weapon out there and that you have to be able to do these kinds of things and so we have to be the honest broker and the enthusiastic communicator and that's not necessarily easy uh, Los Alamos had a fantastic uh, director in Sig Hecker, and he's probably the voice that people look at the most. I mean, he certainly, uh, um, for the previous Korean administration, kept them from proliferating for at least a decade, right? And it was communication, communication, communication. And uh, not not all people can... I mean, communication, I mean, you're a specialist, so I don't need to tell you this, but the fact of the matter is it's you also have to understand the context. And SIG has always been able to speak to the context. And I see that that's what we, the Ukraine gives us uh, opportunity also to remind people why we care, because there's a context. Terry, thinking about Ukraine and bringing the conversation right up to the present, for the last part of our talk, I'd like to ask a few broadly retrospective questions, and then we'll end looking to the future. So to go back to the Seismo Lab, I wonder if you can reflect on some of the things you learned about collaborating, your approach to science, even collegiality that have stayed with you wherever your career has taken you. So I think that the number one thing that really influenced me was what we talked about was the fact that Don Anderson made everybody go to a coffee and said, this is the big problem. And he made everybody participate in this. Uh, that's, uh, at least in the 70s, I don't think that was the natural academic way. you got to get your piece of the puzzle. I'm going to go get a thesis. It's mine. And you were challenged. 
Um, I don't know that the culture of that time was perhaps the best because, I mean, I participated in, the, we talked about the graduate student pre-orals and the job was to tear the student down, make sure they could defend this, but tear them down. I was a master at it, okay? That's not exactly something today I'm proud of, but I was really good at it, right? But the idea that you're part of the whole community to be able to do that comes very strongly from that time at Caltech. There was the colleague down the hall that well, you may not be working on a paper, but he's going to go become the professor of the University of Michigan. That's your colleague. And um, it's every day you would come in, there would be a new earthquake somewhere. And that somebody else is maybe working on that, but the forcing of people to talk about what's the consequences to everything else that's going on here. That intellectual nugget, radioactive as it is, is something that was incredibly um, uh, shaping for me, but also, I think, really good for science. And I, I just think the Seismo Lab is, is a perfect example of that. It incubates so much because, you know, maybe the bad part is you have to keep up with the guy down the hallway. But on the other hand is he's doing something and what does that have to do with what I'm doing? It's a really, really powerful part of modern science. Terry, have you been able to keep up with the Seismo Lab over the years? I try to. I don't always do it. I've sent a lot of students there. Not all of them. I mean, unfortunately, I've sent more students left after one year than stayed. But uh, many of them have graduated. And uh, I have. Um, you know, I'm now such that, uh, I mean, I think, you know, Rob Clayton is still there and Hiro Kanamori is still there. But everybody else, you know, it's it's a different. But, you know, uh, Gurness and people like that, it's easy to... I mean, again, a wonderful uh, guy in terms of that. George Rossman is in the department, but uh, we talk quite a bit about minerals and, you know, just the excitement in terms of associated with that. So there, there is the connection. There's When you ask that, you always, um, the first thing that he is, I get a ping of regret. Why didn't I do more? But, uh, but uh, it is still a fantastic place in terms of uh, the intellectual ferment that's there. Terry, you've led a career where you can reflect on your achievements both in basic science and in public policy. So I wonder if you can if you can think about comparing satisfaction and what you've been able to achieve in both realms. So I think that um, if I, you were to ask me what first, you know, as a context, what my greatest skill is, I'm not, you know, not a Richard Feynman. I don't come up with, you know, charm diagrams. And uh, I have many colleagues that were, are more successful as seismologists. But what I am is the guy that connects all the dots, which makes it perfect for intelligence, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I were to ask why I have been successful, to come back to where your question was, is because I've always embraced the very broad. And um, so I think that the success I've had in the things I've done is connecting things which don't seem connected at all. And most of it ends up being in an intelligence side, which you wouldn't necessarily be able to talk about. But it is, you know, if I could make anything for anybody be real, it would be always ask the question, why? You know, we beat it out of our children at age five or six. Don't ask me why anymore, right? Don't ask me why a lollipop sticks to my hair, right? But the fact of the matter is that curiosity drive is still why I'm successful. I accept nothing at face value. It's always, well, why is that? Why does the hailstone always have a white interior and a clear outside? You know, I mean, there's not a day that doesn't go by that I realize there's a really interesting problem in everything that's there, and that's connecting the dots. And Caltech is a place that if you choose to, you can become incredibly broad and skilled at looking at those dots. Terry, for my last question, looking to the future, I wonder if we can engage in a little generational thinking. Of course, for you, you grew up in what historians call the American century. So much power, so much support for basic science, 
and you 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 ran with it. It it served you so well. Where are you most optimistic that will continue into a new American century? And where are you most concerned, given all the problems that Americans are facing right now, that a kid in a similar situation as you might not have the same opportunities? Yeah, so uh, from the optimistic side, um, we still haven't figured out the world we're in. I mean, um, in the sense that we have instantaneous communication. And I started out by talking about how uh, I'm not a Zoom guy in the end. I mean, I, I, I don't read somebody. I don't understand the body language. Therefore, I'm losing some communication. But the fact of the matter is, I can get much more information mm-hmm. in, a, in a really easy way. Um, it's, it's a little facetious, but the fact of the matter is I can fix everything around the house now because there's a YouTube, I mean, there's a YouTube video for every single thing. I don't mean to be bad, but there's some guy from Arkansas out in the middle of a cabin that can tell you exactly how to fix your furnace. Right. This is a chance to harvest many people that would not necessarily have the opportunity to go into STEM, maybe don't even have the opportunity to go to Caltech. So I see it as a huge, untapped, unrealized societal change. We all have access to everything. So the negative is we're building social structures to try to limit that. And so I'm not so worried about funding for science. I think we'll always be feel underfunded for science. On the other hand, there's a huge amount of science to be done for a lot less money than we do it too. We have to be able to open that aperture to allow that to go forward. So I'm optimistic that we have a revolution afoot and that's access to information. I'm pessimistic they will build social structures, which tell us that's not important. Mm -hmm. You know, my example to this is that everybody believes me when I write a letter and certify a nuclear weapon, but nobody believes me in climate change, right? I mean, it's a mystery to me. I have an iPhone. Everybody has an iPhone, right? You got an iPhone. It's only been around since 2007. And they expect that from me and you and scientists, right? But they don't believe us when we say that we can build a vaccine in six months with the messenger RNA. And that's a social structure we're building. And it's not just the U.S., it's the world. And so uh, I, I don't know how to navigate. I mean, I feel pessimistic right now about how to navigate that. Because I don't, I don't think scientists should be the ones in charge because we're just as bad as anybody else in terms of these. But understanding that there's there's power in that information is what I hope that we can move forward. But I'm incredibly optimistic if we can keep this ability to get information to everyone. I mean, we have a fire in New Mexico right now. Everybody I know of in Northern New Mexico is downloading the real-time modus satellite information. They can tell you where the fire is going better than the people working on it right now. That's exciting. And if we can turn that into um, good for society, good for mankind, um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Okay. <laughs> Terry, on that note, it's been a great pleasure spending this time with you. I'm so glad we were able to do this. You could share your perspective over the course of your career. Thank you so much. Thank you.